If you were here last week, you know that I am just back from the Erosha Conference in Wisconsin. This past week, it's called Creation at the Crossroads, and it was for clergy and faith leaders. Um, you also know that we're part of a one-year pilot program with Erosha, and that pilot program is called Churches of Restoration. And I promise to give you a report of the conference, which is coming. But first, we're going to pray, and then we're going to do a little word study. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are creator, sustainer of the entire universe, and intimate lover of each of our souls. This morning, would you give us a fresh encounter with you? and fresh vision for your love, for your creation. In Jesus' name, amen. So the word rambunctious. What words come to mind when you think of the word rambunctious? Don't be shy. Toddlers and children. Yes. And aren't we called to be children of God? Might that involve rambunctious? Well, what other words? Rowdy, yes. Rambunctious is rowdy. There's energy and playful, absolutely. What else? Wild. Rambunctious is a word with a lot of meanings, and it can either be wielded positively or sometimes negatively. But what I want us to think of with rambunctious is boisterous, unrestrained, irrepressible, exuberant, all of these words, and we're going to hold those together, and you'll understand why in just a minute. But now my, re my promised report from the conference. Um, first, I have a new bucket list thing that I want to do. Um, one of the scientists at the conference told us of an experience that he had, and I was like, I need to do that. Uh, one early spring morning, before dark, he bundles up, trudges silently through the damp, cold wilderness for miles, lays down in a duck blind, is absolutely still and quiet. And he talked about how the cold got to his bones. And I'm like, this does not sound like a good experience. <laughs> but then he said, the sun started to peak over the horizon. And in an instant, 800,000 birds with seven foot wing fan, wingspan took to the skies and cacophonous chaos Phil just blocked out the sun singing their song. He said it was the most transcendent thing he had ever experienced. And um, I think I want to do that someday. I want to go lay down in that duck blind. Have you ever done that, Elizabeth? Do you know it? Elizabeth's from there. Um, but it's along the, the Platte River in Nebraska, actually, not Wisconsin, that these sandhill cranes come during their six-week migration, and they feed in this area they sleep there in the night, and as soon as the sun rises, they all take to the air. And they do this for about six weeks, and then they just move on and disperse to all of their various places. Um, those birds, when they rise in that morning, and they fill the skies, and they sing, they are giving praise to God. And I would say they're being rambunctious, rambunctious praise to God. Now, there's a backstory to the Sandhill Crane. They almost didn't make it. By the mid-20th century, there were just a couple dozen breeding pairs still left in existence. And what had happened was, for millennia, indigenous people were tending the land and they were thriving. And then the European settlers came and they did two things. They dammed the Platte River, so it altered its course, changing the habitat, and they hunted the cranes. And they almost stopped existing. Their ability to rise and give this rambunctious praise to God was almost silenced. But the scientists came along and said, what's happening here? Studied the habitat, studied what the cranes needed, and discovered that although we use that term mile wide, inch deep, usually as sort of a pejorative thing, that's actually what the cranes needed. They needed in the spring for the Platte River to be able to go a mile wide and an inch deep for them to have the habitat they needed in order to feed and move on to um, breed. And so the scientists alerted people what the problem was, and the people cared, and they came and they reworked the land so that the river could do that and spread out in the spring, and the birds came back. And it took time, it took science, it took people of goodwill, it took 
uh, conservation efforts. But now these birds have rebounded and they exist to still give rambunctious praise to God and to observers' transcendental bucket list experiences, which I hope to do someday. So a couple important points about conservation and pre preventing biodiversity loss that came out of this story is that one, science is a necessary part. We wouldn't have known what to do if the scientists hadn't been able to study the birds, their breeding pa patterns, and the habitat. But the scientists alone were not able to fix the problem. They needed people of goodwill, volunteers to come along and to actually do the work of restoring this habitat so that the birds could survive. So creation requires rambunctious gardeners of goodwill for it to flourish. Now, the conference that I attended, we worked our way through three themes in a linear fashion. The first day or so was God's word, which was the theology of caring for creation. The second day was God's world, the science of creation. And then the third day was God's work, the gospel imperative of creation care. And so I'm just very briefly going to give you just a taste of some of the things that we talked about from each one. From God's word, of course, you can't talk about creation without talking about Genesis 1. This is where God created. Now, something that was interesting that I have just finished seminary, but I never heard, is um, there are several Hebrew scholars who believe that although the most famous, you know, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created, that a better translation of that Hebrew might be in the beginning of God's creating, or when God began creating. The idea that God is not a great, you know, clock winder, that he didn't just create and then step back, but he began creating, and his creative effort continues. We wouldn't have life if he did not stay present with us, creating life as we move along, sustaining from the, the giantness of the stars to the tininess of cells and atoms. He is present, breathing life. So it's not a solitary act in the beginning. We see him creating at all times and that the preservation of old things is just as much a creative act as speaking new out of nothing. Um, of course, in Genesis, we see that he calls his creation good, good very good, and he loves his creation. He abides with it. We also spent a lot of time in Colossians 1. Beautiful, beautiful passage. I'll read it to you just briefly here, um, that both the act of creation involves sustaining and that the cross was for both people and creation. Listen. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together, that ongoing act of creation. For God was pleased through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, not just all people, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. What is the relationship of God to the world? Creation cries for a reason to be. Why would a God who is complete in himself, wanting nothing, speak material world into being? And Tim's done a beautiful job preaching on this in the past um, three weeks. And what I just want to reiterate is, God made the world out of joy and delight and self-giving love. He doesn't need the world to be complete, but he wants the world. He loves the world. He abides in the world just out of simple self-giving love and joy. And if God wanted to get rid of the world, all he would have to do is just take a step back and stop sustaining. But he doesn't do that. He's intimate to every part of this world constantly. And he made a way to bring shalom to all of the created world through the incarnation, death, and resurrection of himself in Jesus Christ. So we talked so many beautiful ideas on um, theology, but I have to move on for sake of time. So the science part, whew, that was a heavy day. Both the scientists and the technical nature of what they were bringing us but also the dire nature of what they were bringing us. 
um, they painted a pretty bleak picture about biodiversity loss. Um, historically, we used to lose a handful of species a year, but since industrialization and the, techno tech the age of technology, our disconnection from creation, we're losing thousands of species a year. And the, the rate of um, loss is increasing. We learned about polluted water and its impact. We learned about the global refugee crisis, which is driven by environmental factors. We learned from um, a maternal fetal health doctor about the amount of contaminants found in newborn blood, regardless of location, and in human breast milk. And we learned about the mental health impact on the most vulnerable people who have lack of access to creation, herded into urban environments with little environment for exposure. It was heavy, and it was all day, and it was hard. And um, basically what we walked away with is people aren't healthy, the land isn't healthy, the water isn't healthy, the air isn't healthy, and the trajectory is it's not getting better yet. We, um, another discouraging thing is that our brains are designed to actually perceive threats over calm, beauty, awe, or other positive emotions. And so when we're presented with all of this threat of creation is sick, and yet we need to connect to God, the creator who holds it, our brains want to stay in this oh no place rather than this worship place. And so we have that hurdle to overcome spiritually as well. So at the end of the day, the scientists all sat on a panel and almost every question that the pastors posed to them was, how do you hold on to hope? Or, you know, some sort of variation of that question. And it's a good question when you look at how heavy this information is. We can no more save the earth than we can save ourselves. And what we desperately need is a solution to sin as far as the curse is found. And thanks be to God, there is a solution. God, as we read in Colossians 1, was pleased to reconcile all things through Jesus Christ by making peace with his blood shed on the cross. And so in light of all of these statistics, how do we hold on to hope? Well, Tish Harrison Warren, one of our Anglican priests, used to have a weekly New York Times op-ed column. Did anybody subscribe to that? Yeah. Um, one week, she wrote about Arosha, this organization that we've partnered with in this, in this pilot program. And here's what she said in her column, talking about creation and these statistics we were just mentioning. Things are really bad, but Arosha's work is infused with joy. It emphasizes that small things matter and that hope is found in the reality that our work allows us to participate in a redemption story. So the beauty is that we're in the already and the not yet. Jesus did this work and his resurrection means that all things will be reconciled. And even though the work isn't fully complete yet, God is present in doing that work and inviting us into that work with him. That's our call. That's our mission to be gospel agents who understand that the gospel is, yes, absolutely for human souls, but it's also for the reconciling and restoring of this creation that God loves, that he created out of delight and joy and calls us to participate with him in restoring. Um, briefly, our... Um, our conference started with a river, the Platte River, and the story of the Sandhill Cranes. Our scriptures start with a river running through Eden, past the tree of life. And then the New Jerusalem that Jennifer read about for us also has a river running past the tree of life. The, we know the end of the story. We know that right now things aren't looking super great scientifically when we look at these facts, but we know that God has a plan to restore and that that ending is happy, it's coming. And that, that doesn't set us free to throw up our hands and say, oh, well, it's gonna end well, but that he's actually doing that work right now and inviting us to join him in that work of ongoing reconciling and redeeming. He is redeeming and it will be fully redeemed. That verse, John three sixteen, probably the most famous verse in pop culture, for God so loved the world. We tend to interpret that, and some Bible interpreters do interpret that as for God so loved people. But the Greek word there is actually for God so loved the cosmos, a word that's the same in Greek and English. We know what the cosmos is. It's all the created order. 
He sent Jesus because he so loved all the created order. That the, but uh, God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world, the cosmos, might be saved through him. We intimately know the creator who sustains, and we know the end of the story. It's a happy one. And that brings us to the two greatest commandments. Jesus summed up the two greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is our work. This is the work that God has given us to do. And to love God is to love what he loves, is to love people of all tribes and nations, is to love his creation. And to love our neighbor is to care about what impedes their flourishing and to act. Now, in closing, the scientist who told us that Sandhill Crane story was not a believer. He was the dean of the environmental sciences program at the University of Wisconsin. And his program paid to bring in all of these clergy to teach us this. Why? Why would a state school pay to teach this to Christian ministers? Because they understand that these issues cannot be solved by scientists alone, that they need people of goodwill to come along and to help them in the problems that they're identifying um, to, to help creation flourish. And he was the one who told us, he's standing there, not a believer, telling pastors, your Christian faith means that creation care is a central gospel responsibility, not a side quest. And with this profound responsibility, pastors, is the capacity for profound joy. That was the challenge we received from a scientist who is not a believer. And so what he asked us as Christian clergy to go back to our congregations and extend an invitation was to become rambunctious gardeners. That was his language. Invite your people to be rambunctious gardeners, to be part of this work. He doesn't intimately know the Savior who came and shed his blood for this creation, but we do. And so we get to partner with him and what he's already doing and to see the profound joy that comes with the profound responsibility for caring for his creation. In so doing, we acknowledge gardening isn't easy. It's not easily controlled, but it is still our responsibility. We're reliant on external factors as rambunctious gardeners like soil, sunlight, and rain that we don't control. And that all we can do is nurture the context and trust the creator who loves for the growth to come. In acknowledging our lack of control, there's a freedom to be a non-anxious presence as we release what we can't control to God and trust him to do the work that he intends to do. That's a living in the truth. And so I'll close by asking, are we at Trinity North Shore willing to be a place where we trust the self-giving love of the creative Trinity enough to live in the reality of rambunctious gardening, to be gardener guardians of this sacred creation that he loves, a non-anxious people who acknowledge so much of this world is beyond our control, yet we're entering into the heart of a good creator who loves us and abides with his creation and provides what it needs to flourish. And so I'll invite us now to close together in prayer. Take a couple deep breaths. Listen to the wind. The scripture word for the Holy Spirit is wind and breath and life. And the wind reminds us how close this spirit is to us right now. Feel the ground. Feel the wind. That river that flowed through Eden. That river that will flow through the New Jerusalem. There is a river flowing through us of God's love at this moment. And I invite you to imagine us as a church on this hilltop sitting by the tree of life. Feeling the flow of the river of living water that gives so no one will thirst. And to consider who is downstream from us. Who is the Spirit calling us to share the good news of this river, this unpolluted river of life that is both the end of the story, but also part of our story now? 
It's for you. Drink and don't be thirsty. It's for our neighbor. It's for the good of all creation. Spend a moment in silence, seeing what Jesus wants to say to you about that. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for the happy end of the story and the gift of the invitation to be your co-gardeners of this creation, rambunctious gardeners, full of joy as we carry your good news of healing and reconciliation. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.